<laughs> Beautiful. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, everyone watching us online, welcome to Vision Church of Lockhart. I got distracted for a minute. <laughs> I want to welcome you all here tonight. Welcome everybody here that's with us tonight. I'm so glad that y'all are here. Um, I missed y'all last Wednesday. We, you know, we were keeping an eye on the weather and, you know, we just kind of worry about people that live outside the city limits and, you know, so, but we're here tonight. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Let's pray and we'll get started and continue our Bible study. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Father. Thank you for everyone that came out tonight. Father, all those watching us online, Father. Lord, I pray that this word, Father, would take root in their heart and, and just grow fruit, Father. That it would be rooted, Father, deep in their heart. And that they would live it every day, Father. Open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to receive all that you have for us tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. We're um, chapter 5, and we're starting at verse 14. Uh, the first, we did the first half, and it was talking about the law, right? It was, um, it was talking about grace and not law, because they're trying to follow the law. The Galatians are trying to follow the law. And now he's going to be speaking about how we have liberty from verse uh, 13, I think we, yeah, it's talking about the liberty and that law. So we are, verse 14, it says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. That's the King James. Let's read the simple English or English. It says the entire law is made complete in this one command. Love, love, peop, love other people the same way you love yourself. And the message says, for everything we know about God's word is summed up in the single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Paul states in Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law is to be fulfilled by the Christian, by the Holy Spirit. The term all the law used here is not referring to the law as a legalistic system of earning justification as Paul has been using it, but rather as the spirit of the law as the expression of God's will. Christian love fulfills fully performs and fully obeys all that the Mosaic law would require of a person. Jesus teaches the same truth under the law of Christ. In, those, in Matthew 7 and Luke 6, the quotation that Paul is using from the, is from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, and is applied as love being an eternal principle of both covenants. The Weiss translation states, for the whole law in one utterance stands fully obeyed, namely in this, love your neighbor as you do yourself. Paul also, also speaks of this in Romans 13. Amen. Love is the key to everything working in your Christian life. You know, there's a lot of things that uh, there's people and um, that will be hateful and people that um, that will will just be hateful, right? And uh, but we're to look at them with the love of Christ, because Jesus died for all of us. We we might not agree with them, uh, we might not like them very much, right? But we are called to love them. Amen. And so when some, you have someone that's like a thorn in your side, you know, because you will, you will have some people that rub you the wrong way. I think they call them sandpaper people, right? <laughs> but you need to look at them with the love of Christ because Jesus did die for them also. Amen? And maybe there's something in us that needs to be, you know, sanded down or, or changed, you know? 
So if we, if we walk in love, then we're, we, we're keeping the, 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 command, the law, right? But we're not trying to keep every law. We're just, we're just walking in love. And the love of Christ has, I mean, everything that, that's in, in Christ and everything that you want the Lord to work through you or, or with you is going to come by loving. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Verse 15 says, but if ye bite and devour one another, <laughs> take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Amen. That was funny. I'm sorry. King James. <laughs> I was thinking, I didn't devour. <laughs> I just gave him back a, a little of what he was dishing out. Y'all don't know. I'm talking to my family. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, let's read the... The message translation, if you bite and ravish each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? Amen. Let's see, I wrote a note. Oh, okay. Godly people speak faith and love. Okay, here it says, Paul is, is warning in verse 15 of what happens when the opposite of love is practiced. A person bites with his mouth. So Paul is probably talking about the sense of malicious talk. In classical Greek, bite, devour, and consume all speak of the activity of wild animals destroying one another. If a person bites an apple enough times, it will be consumed. Paul's answer to these sins of flesh is given in the following, in the following verse 16. And I put here, people will never be great men and women of faith if, if this is what they're doing. Bad, talking bad, malicious talk, talking uh, bad about a person. And, and what I was saying a, a little while ago that I'm talking about, because I, I put a word here, but it, now I remember what, I was, what it brought to my memory and what I was thinking. What I was telling you is sometimes we get offended. And the 20 years that I was in unforgiveness, I was, I talked malicious. Because how many of y'all know that, that Christian people will hurt you? And that's the worst kind. <laughs> no, everybody's loving, right? Everybody's walking. We're going to get to that. Everybody's walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. <laughs> Well, anyway, the person that offended me was an elder of the church that I grew up in. I was a child, and I was truly offended and, and um, traumatized, really. But uh, as I grew, and, and, and I couldn't get rid of that offense because it was a deep secret that I had to keep. And the more I held on to it, and that person would get up and maybe testify, and I would just squirm in my seat, and I'm not going to lie, I just wish he was dead. And that's malicious, right? And, and, and I, I used to think in my heart, I hate you, you know, those kind of things. And that's malicious talk. And, and you, you can't, you, it, that can't happen, like it says here. <laughs> Where's your freedom then? Because you're not free. I was in a prison for those 20 years that I was angry and hurt and bitter and offended. I couldn't get rid of it. But one day I had to. One day I heard a word. One day an evangelist came to our church. <laughs> and the word of God set me free. But then the, the hard part is going to that person and asking them to forgive you, 
for something that all this time you said it was your fault. You did this. But it wasn't for his purpose. It was for mine. Because if you don't release that, then you will never be free. And this is what, what this is saying here. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. <laughs> in no time at all, you'll be in, say it for me, anil, an, annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be? You're not truly free if, if, if the, you know, this is what you're doing, hurting each other or talking bad and everything. And the only person that it ever hurt was me. Because that man lived his life, and I didn't. Amen? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. But it's good to be free. <laughs> you need to be free. <laughs> so you can, you'll have to, uh, oh, anyway. I was going to say, I, there's a song, but I can't think of it right now. Shackles. Do you know that song? <laughs> I, my cousin, which is, I'm an which uh, I guess y'all know she, she was in prison and she's gonna be at our ladies meeting and she's gonna, she's got some great things for us in April. So I hope everybody will come. We changed the date, right, sister? It's gonna be April 2nd, the first Saturday instead of the second. And I was promised, I said, when you get out, <laughs> I said, we're going we're gonna to get somebody to play that song for us, and we're going to dance all around <laughs> because we're going to be free. She, she was in a literal prison, and I was in a spiritual prison. But it's not any different. Amen? Thank you, Lord, that he has a way that we can be free. Hallelujah. Okay, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, let's read all three. The Amplified says, but I say walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh of human nature without God. That's the Amplified. The message says, my counsel, my counsel is this, live freely, anim animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. Amen? Thank you, Lord. It says, just as a person who is walking takes one step at a time, place, places one foot in front of the other, so the Christian is to take each step in his or her Christian life, depending on and trusting in the Holy Spirit to deliver him from the lust of the flesh. Notice that Paul does not say that if you become strong enough as a Christian, you will not have desires of the flesh. But he says that through dependence upon the Holy Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Paul states that within our natural bodies, there is a law of sin dwelling in our members. You read about that in Romans 7. That will never change until we are glorified. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 44, I think it's just, is um, talking about being that the natural is sown and the spiritual is, is grown. So we must exchange our weakness for his strength by depending upon the Holy Spirit to deliver us from sin's evil grip. This is done through faith in Christ's spirit. This is Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15. And by yielding ourselves unto him, Romans 6, 13. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So we must every day Walk in the Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit's deliverance does not work automatically in the believer's life. He must depend upon it. He must be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. 
So every day, like we said, we've got to be a living sacrifice, right? Live according to the word of God and, and, and ask the Holy Spirit. Depend on him. You know, surrender to him. Say, Holy Spirit, help me today. And he will. Because sometimes you'll say a word and just like that you'll feel a check. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> or maybe, you know, and then you have to say, I'm sorry, you know, forgive, let it go. But know that that's something that you need to work on or, or maybe sometimes don't be too quick to answer and think about it. Amen. Verse 17 says, For the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would do. The New King James Version says, For the flesh lust against the spirit... And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. I'm going to read one more. The, the English. Simple English. The human nature wants things which are against the spirit. The spirit wants things which are against our human nature. These opposite each other. Because of this you cannot do the things that you really intend to do. So here it says, the flesh and the spirit have opposite desires manifesting opposite results. And we're going to get into that here in a minute. Paul states that this struggle, this struggle causes us to not do the things that we really intend to do. A parallel passage to this would be Romans 7, 19, in which Paul states, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Paul answers, Paul's answer for deliverance is not in self-effort, but rather in total dependence upon the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, to break the bonds of sin by dependence upon Him. That's the only way we're going to make it, brothers and sisters, just to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit to help us every day. Amen. Verse 18, it says, but if you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The Knox translation says, it is not, it is by letting the Spirit lead you that you free yourself from the yoke of the law. And the message says, why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? The Galatians were still trying to live the Christian life, but were going about it by self-effort, self-dependence, and by the principle of the law. The spirit and the law are contrasted and shown to be opposite to one another. The spirit's ability to deliver from sin is quite different from the law's ability of self-effort. Verse 18 states that, if ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. That is, we are not under the law's precepts in order to earn God's approval. Yielding ourselves to the control of the Spirit is quite different than yielding yourselves to the law, which becomes slavery to the letter and not the word. I think here is sometimes where, where we fail. Um where it says here that the Christian, the Galatians were still trying to live a Christian life dependent on themselves, right? By self-effort, self-dependence, and principles of the law. And, um, you know, when somebody comes to the Lord and they're new in the Lord, and a lot of times, you know, we get them saved and, and then we tell them, okay, be good. <laughs> don't, don't drink, don't cuss. Come to church, read your Bible, give your tithes, do all these, do and don't do these, do this and don't do that. Be a good Christian, pat them in the back and go. They fail. We set them up to fail because, because they're um, they're going to be trying to do it in their in in their self by themselves, 
and their effort in the flesh because they don't know anything. You know, we need to right away start discipling them. You know, that's where there's evangelism. They go out and reach souls. And then y'all send them right, get into a good Bible church and, and get discipled. Start learning what the Word of God says. And, and this is what I say, Brother Billy, maybe you can, you know, you're more evangelizing, but, you know, sometimes people say, I don't want, ah, no, I don't want to accept the Lord because I don't want to change. I have to change, right? I always tell them, you don't have to change, right? Because the Lord says, come as you are. You don't have to change, just come as you are. If you believe in your heart and you receive them, you know, something great is going to happen in you. But don't stop there. Come to church. Let us be here. Let us teach you. Read, you know, we're going to give you some things to read. Go to Ephesians. It tells you everything that you are in Christ. You know, we need to teach them who they are in Christ. And as they're learning, they don't have to change they're going to change without any effort on their part. It's going to come natural. It's going to come because the word of God is going to be in them and it's going to change them. You know, we try to, they try to change on their own. You know, like the guy that told it, you know, well, I'm a good person. I don't need to go to church. Well, <laughs> you're going to be a good person, but God, the spirit of God's not in you. Because when you accept the Lord, what happens? The Spirit of God comes to be one flesh with you, one with you, right? And so he's in there. So now we have to preach and teach to the soul so the soul will get in line with the Spirit and their life is going to change naturally without, any, without them trying because the Holy Spirit is going to change them. Jesus is going to change them. Amen? And that's what we need to make sure, you know, nobody gets past it, a new convert that, that, that we're teaching them and that we're showing them. I don't know if that's right. If you tell them, you don't need to change. <laughs> but I think, right, the, come as you are, and then the word of God, the, the word, the preaching, and the word of God and the teaching is what's going to help them change naturally because the spirit of God lives in them. They have a new nature but they don't know they have a new nature until you start teaching them. Amen? We'll probably talk about that more after. Verse, where am I, 18? 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. These are works of the, of the flesh. Have you ever said, I hate you? <laughs> hatred. <laughs> Variances. That's just disagreements. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, envying, Envyings, <laughs> more than one envy, murders, <laughs> drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Such things. So in other words, this isn't the whole list, but such things like this. And then, and then here that says that they, I think the they there is talking about unbelievers, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Because if you're, if you're a child of God, then that's not going to be in your nature to do these things. Amen. Amen. Let's read uh, the message. The message says, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, 
frenzied and joyless grabs of happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, an impotence to love and to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of deeper personalizing everyone in, into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> well, let me read what it says, and then I'll tell you. What. Paul is now giving a clearly def defined standard to show whether the Holy Spirit or the flesh is leading the person. If a person is walking after the flesh, he or she will uh, will manifest to some degree the works of the flesh. Let me hold right there for a minute and, and go back to what I was saying a few minutes ago um, about telling people to come as they are and then, you know, with, with the word, they will change without effort. The word will change them. But sometimes, you know, in, 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 um, in camp meetings or uh, tent meetings, you see a lot of people being healed on the spot. And that will minister to people more than anything. And that will make a, people, a person hungry for the Lord. And they'll be ready to be ministered to and, and grow because they're going to be seeking. And that's what we want. That's, that's, uh, that's what they're looking for. That's what people are looking for, I think, now, especially now in these times that we're in. They're hungry for that, and we need to be out there reaching them. Okay, back, back to this. That was bugging me, so I had to say that. Okay. Paul categorized the works of the flesh, the fleshly actions in four areas. Essential results, which is fornication or prostitution, uncleanliness, meaning moral impurity and, and lasciviousness, which deals with promiscuity, such as premarital, extramarital, sexual relations, and things of that nature. Second, false worship, idolatry, sorcery, and witchcraft. Third thing, personal and social relations. Enmities, meaning personal animosities, strife, meaning rivalry and discords, jealousy of an unnatural kind, wrath, people, will be vengeful toward one another, factions, divisions within the body, divisions among individuals and within married couples, parties, envyance, meaning, meaning feelings of ill and will, ill will. For temperance, drunkenness, and by rivalries, by rivalries or orgies, rivalings, revelings, good. That just means partying, wild parties, and drunkenness. That's what it means. I should just say that word. <laughs> Having listed all these things, he points out uh, the, that people who practice these things will not enter the kingdom of God because these are works that are evidence of people who are unsaved. So if you're, if you're doing all these things or some of these things, you need to check yourself because you might be unsaved. <laughs> because it's not in your nature. Because when you come to the Lord, you, God is in you. God is in you and your spirit. Your nature changed. It changed that day. You're, you've got God's nature. And if you truly uh, made that, that, that confession of faith, then you're saved. Then God came to live in you. And you're going to wake up and you're just going to be, it's just going to be awesome, you know. You're going to notice the difference. You're going to know. But a lot of people, they start thinking about, oh, I have to do these things. But we need to just bask in the love of Christ and then grow. And the word's going to change you. 
And you're going to wake up, you might have a habit or something, and one day you're going to wake up, and maybe, you know, your dog would make you mad in the mornings, and you're going to wake up, and the dog might be doing the same thing, but it's not going to make you angry because you have a new nature. Things change. And it's awesome to see, you might wake up, I know I woke up sometimes, I said, wow, that didn't make me mad, <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> I'm free, <laughs> you know? And I said, you know, if this would have happened, you know, you can see it because you're going to see it and the, and the word is going to change you. And that, that's exciting. Oh, well, anyway. You shall not inherit, did I read all that? You shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Where was I? Did I read all this for y'all? Oh, and say, Paul is dealing with that which is the habitual practice as over against that which is a believer simply falls into an occasional, an occasional basis. That's something you, you're going to be, you practice, like I was just saying. It's not something, you might sin. You might commit a sin as a Christian, but you're not living it, you know? If you commit a sin, you go, you know, you repent, Lord, I repent, forgive me. Well, you're forgiven, but you want to repent. And he'll forgive you and don't do it again. Like he told the lady at the well, you know, go and sit. Was it the, no, the lady caught in adultery, go and sin no more. Right? She sinned, but she came to the Lord and then he goes, just go and sin no more. Thank you, Lord. The phrase shall not inherit the kingdom of God may be rendered in some languages as will not enjoy having God rule over them or will never have the joy of God ruling them. And this is what I was going to share with you, that the kingdom of God is now. This is not saying that you're not going to heaven. Because I know a lot of people say, if you do these things, you're not going to heaven. That's not what it's saying. It says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's everything that's in his word, all his promises and everything. Amen? In, in uh, Colossians 1.13, it says that when, when you come into the Lord, he, it says that you are transformed from darkness to light and you walk into a new kingdom. We live in a new kingdom. If you're a Christian, we're living in a new kingdom. And we, we inherit all his promises. You know, that's why we have to go to the word and see what are his promises? What did I inherit when I received Christ? What belongs to me? Who does he say I am? You know, and, and all those things, that's what you inherit. But if you're living life like with all these things here, it, it will block, it will block your inheritance. You will not live in your inheritance. Amen? Because this is saying that, that you would, like here having, having these things, it says that you're, it's just evident that you're, you're acting like people that aren't saved. Amen? And I've lived this. And that's why I know that, that living in the kingdom of God, we're living in a different realm. Amen? Because when I was in unforgiveness, uh, when I came out of it and I'm, my life is being transformed, like it was just a gush. And, and I think the Lord was just, I had lost so much and he was bringing me up to par. <laughs> and so, um, but during that time, you couldn't tell that I was any different from the world. Amen. I wasn't any different than the world I did. I remember I told y'all that I, I, I knew that God was in here and if my Bible was in my car, I'd hide it because I didn't want God to see me or, or dishonor him or whatever. I would have respected him because God's in here. But when, in one time of prayer, I was praying to the Lord and, and I was doubting my faith because I had a big step to take and, and, and I was going, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. I, I remember we were praying, and, and all of a sudden, I saw this little girl standing in front of me, and it was a vision. I saw her, and, and I'm looking at her, and I realized that she's me. I was looking at myself, and the Lord told me, when, when, you were, when I gave my life to the Lord, 
he came to live in me. And he said, I've never left you. And that's what the word says. He will never leave you or forsake you. It was me that was blocking my inheritance because I was living like an unsaved person. And that was, that's why it made it so difficult to just say, oh, I'm a Christian, <laughs> because I knew all the do's and don'ts, you know? And if you're going by the do's and don'ts, then you feel condemned, you know? And it was like a life of condemnation. I didn't want to see that. I didn't want to live that. But the Lord told me, I've, been, I've never left you. I'm right here. And that's his word. And so now... I'm walking in, the, in, in his inheritance. I'm living in the kingdom. Y'all are all, li- we are all living in the kingdom. And your life should be different than the people that live in the world. Your neighbor, you know, the people that are unsaved. Amen? Amen. And it is. And, and one day, um, just to go a little further, the Lord showed me that, that I'm in a different realm. I was at work, and this woman came in, and, and she's, her mouth is going 100 miles an hour, and I'm standing there. I'm looking at her. She's, she's gossiping and, and complaining and, and trying to see if I would say anything, and I'm, I'm just looking at her. And all of a sudden, I just saw, like, 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 like glass shower, Mary. You, have you seen some, you know, the, the glass on your shower? Some of them had design, and it's like rain. And, and I saw like this, like rain, and, and she was on that side, and I was on this side. And the Lord was showing me that we were in two different realms. So we're living in a different realm. You don't really need uh, anything to separate you, but we're in a different realm. We're, we live in the kingdom of God. Remember the, the, the prayer that says, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done? He came. <laughs> He came, and now we're, we're living in the kingdom. So our life should be totally different than anybody else living in the world. Amen? Or not in the world, but unsaved. I mean, unsaved person. Okay, let me move on. Uh, verse 22 and 23. But, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against, against such there is no law. Hallelujah. <laughs> the Amplified. I like the Amplified. It has more, more description. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes, is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, and even tempered forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, Faithfulness, meekness, humility, gentleness, self-control, self-restraint, con- continence. Such, against such things there is no law that can bring a charge. Thank you, Lord. The message is good, too. It says that, but what happens when we live God's way? It's a good question, huh? He brings gifts into our lives. Much the same way that a fruit appears in an orchard, things, things, life, affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only, it only get in the way. It only gets in the way. (laughs) That's the message. Amen. Jesus speaks of bearing fruit in John 15 and declares, without me, you can do nothing. Notice that fruit is not a produce by the believer, is not produced by the believer, but by the Spirit as we live in union with Him. Amen? Today's English version states, but the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. 
Our part is to yield and trust. God's part is to produce the fruit. <laughs> See, it's not you. The fruit's in you. All this is in you. You just have to yield to it. And it'll, it'll flow, flow through. Amen. The phrase, against such there is no law, is another way of saying the law was never meant for people who demonstrate these qualities and there are no laws which speak against people who live this way. There's nothing that can come against you. You're living God's way, right? There's nothing to condemn you. Verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affect affections and lusts. The message says, among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our way, our own way, and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Christians crucified the evil nature with its affections and lust in the, in the sense that when they put their faith in the Lord Jesus, they received the actual benefits of their identification with Christ and his death on the cross. You got all your benefits. <laughs> We got all the benefits, amen? Have crucified the flesh is in the aorist tense, suggesting an action that took place in the past. This does not refer to self-crucifixion or self-mortification, but rather to Christians identifying with Christ's death. Because when, when we get to closer to uh, the Easter, you see programs, and, well, in the Spanish, I've never seen anything here like that, but people will self, mor mort yeah, mortification. <laughs> they, they beat themselves, and, they, and they're trying to, they'll go on knees walking, or they'll carry a cross, and they'll even crucify themselves to, to, the, to a cross, and we've seen those kind of things on, on TV, on the Spanish stations, and and that's just blasphemy. That's just saying Christ. That's so, to me, it's like mocking Jesus. It's awful. I don't think they realize that. But you know, that's like the word says that traditions of man make the word of God of no effect. That's just crazy. Well, anyway, verse. Did I? I'm losing my place. I think I read all that, right? Did I skip it? <laughs> Crucifix. Okay, here we go. I got off on self crucifixion. No, okay, Romans 6, 6, which says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Victory over the flesh with its passions and lusts has been provided by Christ and his death. Faith must continually lay hold of this truth or the believer will be tempted to try to secure victory by self-effort. Verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The Amplified says, If we live by the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. The message says, Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. This is, Paul keeps telling them, walk in the spirit, walk in the spirit. We need to walk in the spirit, amen. To live in the spirit has the connotation to the spirit being the source of our life, thus the exhortation is to the Galatians who have divine, who have divine life resident 
in their beings to conduct themselves under the guidance, impulses, and energy of that life. This is twice now that Paul has admonished the Christians to walk in the Spirit. Verse 16 and 15. In verse 26, it says, Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. The Amplified says, Let us not become vainglorious and self-conceited, competitive and challenging and provoking and irritating to one another, envying and being jealous of one another. That's the Amplified. The message says, that means we will not compare ourselves to each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do in our lives. Ain't that right? Each of us is an original. Amen. We are all originals. There's nobody else in the world just like you. Isn't that awesome? Of the billions and billions and billions of people in the world, there's nobody else just like you. Thank you, Lord. Paul may be expressing in a negative way that danger of falling, failing to walk in the spirit. What he characterized is the manifestation of the flesh. Vainglory may be rendered always saying how great we are or always saying, look at me. Provoking one another would be to trouble or irritate one another. Envy carries the idea of being jealous of one another. Amen. And we should never do that because we're one of a kind. <laughs> we're one of a kind and, and we all have a part in the body of Christ. It takes all of us. Amen. It makes all, all of us are part of his body. Thank you, Lord. Well, that concludes chapter five. Next week we'll start and maybe finish chapter six. It's not as long. We'll see. Um, I really don't like to go through it real quickly because that, I think that's how we read the Bible a lot of times. We just read through it and sometimes we miss what it's actually saying and take time to really, you know, make sure we're understanding what, what the Word is saying. Amen? So we're going to pick up our offering now. If anybody has offering or tithes that they want to bring, you can bring them up. If anyone watching us online, if you want to give to our ministry, we would welcome that, and we would appreciate you and, and bless you. Uh, you can uh, go to our website at bcblockhart.com, go to the giving tab, and just follow the prompts, and you will get an email receipt to email, email to you. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss, and then uh, we'll let our viewing audience go for the night. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson, Lord. I thank you, Father, for, Father, just your word, Lord, and for your presence, Father, and for your Holy Spirit, Father, that that would be the desire of our hearts to just walk in the Spirit, Father, every day, Lord, just being led by you. Thank you, Lord, for, thank you, Lord, for leading us, for just your presence, Father. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. We love you, Lord. I, I pray that this word has uh, just refreshed us, Father, just a refreshing. Thank you, Lord. I'm just feeling you refreshing me, Father. And I just thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Dismiss us as we dismiss, Father. We, I thank you that, that you guide us and direct us as we go home, Father, and that we will be energized and and start a new day walking in the spirit and that we will be back together again in, in, on Sunday. And we thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ooh, thank you, Lord. <laughs>